Is it contrary to Jesus and Paul to oppose these restrictions? My short answer is no. It is not contrary to their example or their teaching, uh, because what they've done is given us a responsibility to know what is right in every circumstance. And, uh, and, and, and it is, you know, we can talk about the hypocrisy if we want of a government that will allow hundreds of people to congregate in a Walmart or a superstore, uh, you know, a Costco, hundreds of people can congregate in there. And I assure you that every time I go into one of those places, I see people walk, you know, they're, they're, they're shopping for the same item on the shelf. They're standing side by side, reaching, you know, for whatever. There's no social distancing in those places. Hey guys, this is extremely important. Rebel News is going to keep fighting to bring you the other side of the story, but it's only a matter of time before YouTube shuts us down entirely. So I need you to go to rebelnews.com now and sign up to make sure you don't miss out on any of the action. Adam Sos for Rebel News here. This is going to be a little bit of a different video. You know, there's been a lot of disagreement out there from different Christian bodies as to what exactly Jesus Christ would do in the face of this pandemic if he was alive today. What is the example that Jesus Christ sets? You can see people, um, churches like Knox United, sending out letters saying that it's great that Pastor James Coates has been arrested and it's long overdue that his, uh, his church should be gated up and fenced up. On the other side, you have Pastor Arthur Palowski, uh, who is insistent that the fight for freedom and resistance against tyranny is at the core of the biblical message. I'm excited to be joined by Schaefer Parker, something of a biblical expert, and he's going to take a look right at the biblical context at Jesus' life, at the example of St. Paul, uh, and, and help us maybe shed some light on whether resisting authorities is a religious and Christian right, or if it's against what Jesus taught. Looking forward to be joined by Schaefer Parker in just a moment here. You can probably tell right away that there's a trace of a Southern American accent still <laughs> attached to the way I speak. And I am from originally from Texas. And I always worry that people will hear, oh, you're from the United States. Well, then you have nothing to say to Canadians. But I, I want to underline something that I think we forget all too often. And that is that Christianity is truly a universal religion. The things I want to talk about today are based upon biblical principles that, in my view, apply around the world and to every single human being that ever lived, because all of us are made in the image of God. And we're all called back to him through faith in, in his son, Jesus Christ. And, and so the, the principles for li living that you find right through the Bible, uh, some of them are first stated in the Old Testament and then expanded in the New and so forth. Nevertheless, they are universal in application. And so the things that I have to say today, in my view, are universal in, in application. Obviously, the exact application varies from place to place because of a lot of reasons that we can all kind of think of for ourselves. Nevertheless, universal in their in their uh, application. So, and in terms of that application, we want to bring it to the very real circumstance today that we see um, within the dialogue surrounding some of the restrictions that have been enacted due to lockdown, particularly how uh, distinctly places of worship have been isolated and, and faced uh, extreme measures and a reduction of the number of people who can, can uh, attend, especially when contrasted with, say, a Walmart, a Costco, some of these other places. Um, but there's been a major sort of attitude on both sides of that lockdown conversation um, of what would Jesus do? And there seems to be a tension between um, between the, the ultra safe and uh, measured defense of life and then the courageous lack of fear sort of angle. So there's there's sort of a, a tension between the two sides, both professing to do or saying that they are doing what Jesus would do. Uh, maybe you can provide a little sort of scriptural context so we can see uh, see maybe uh, some more some more uh, enlightened perspective on this conversation. Well, again, I always I shrink from saying that what I'm going to say is more enlightened than someone else. Uh, we're all, you know, we're all working together to try to understand God's word as clearly as possible. But there are some things that I, I do find are seem to be widespread misunderstandings of what the of the of the Jesus who is presented in the Bible. Um, you know, you grow up as children. Uh, you 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 are given in Sunday school the impression that Jesus is always gentle, always meek and mild and and uh, wouldn't hurt a fly and. You know, and some of that comes from the fact that he loved children and welcomed them into his presence. And that was quite unique for an adult in his period of history to welcome children. And so, and he blessed the mothers and, and you know, and honored women 
And he did a number of things that were countercultural for his day. Mm-hmm. And so we tend to overthink Jesus, especially when we hear all that he has to say about forgiveness of sin and not and, and turning the other cheek and, and, and so forth. There are a number of things that seem to make him, um, uh, you know, a kind of almost a milk toast, to use an old expression, uh, a fellow who would who would never back, who would always back away and never li- uh, walk forward toward conflict. We forget that he opened his public ministry in the Gospel of John with cleansing the temple. That is to say, he walked right in, and, and you'll remember, and this is a very important principle that that in, in Jesus's day, yes, the Romans were the overall, uh, they overall were the rulers of that area, but they had given much of the leadership and much of the uh, application of the law to the Jewish leadership. In fact, the one law that they could not operate for in the, within themselves was that of capital punishment. That's why, that's why you find the high priest taking Jesus to Pilate to get permission for him to be hung on a cross because they did not have the authority to condemn a man to death. Other than that, the Jewish leadership, there was a, a kind of a combination of religious and secular Supreme Court. They called it the Sanhedrin, and these elders that belonged to the Sanhedrin ruled over Jerusalem and ruled over Judea, the whole surrounding area. And so when Jesus walks into the temple and begins to throw over the tables of the money changers and using a whip of cords, he's driving the people out, driving the animals out. He is uh, directly defying, according to the Gospel of John, he did this as one of the first public acts when he began his ministry at age 30. Then we find him at age 33 going back into Jerusalem where all that you know, sales of animals at the temple for sacrifice and the exchange of money uh, for travelers who were coming from long distances so they could pay the temple tax with with actual Hebrew money and so forth. All that had been reinstated, and he goes in and cleanses the temple a second time. Two acts of absolute rebellion against the powers that existed in his day, and on nobody's say so or authority other than his own. I think that's really important to to recognize. But then we need to keep in mind as well that throughout his ministry, uh, he was constantly doing things to sort of uh, pinch the the, uh, the cheeks of the Pharisees and the other leaders of their society. For example, he was always in hot water for doing good works on the Sabbath healing people and and so forth, uh, allowing his disciples to pluck heads of grain and rub the husks off between their hands and then eat them on the on the Sabbath day. And he was forever saying things like, you know, the, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And the son of man, meaning himself, is the Lord of the Sabbath. You know, I'm in charge here, not you. Uh, he was directly challenging the authority of the recognized powers of his day. And I think we have somehow that sort of slipped our minds that 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 if we're going to be like Jesus, yes, we need to love the children. We need to honor women. Well, there are a lot of things we need to do to be like Jesus. In addition, we need to make sure that we are defending our rights when there's a government that's trying to take them away. Well, it's certainly if Jesus was just milk toast and friendly, he probably would not have been crucified for his public opposition and ministries. I think people forget about that part of the story. Yes. Let me speak to that, if I may. I, I'm glad you brought that up because that that is exactly right. Jesus, you can read about this in Luke chapter 13. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Now, what's interesting is that for the first time, we have a record of Jesus defying a, uh, a, a Roman authority. Now, all the way through, I've already described how he defied the Jewish authorities, but now we find Jesus defying a Roman authority because in Luke chapter 13, we find the Pharisees coming to Jesus and they say, you've got to get away from this place because Herod is looking for you. He wants to kill you. Now, Herod was a Roman. Uh, he was a, a sort of a Jew, half Jew kind of a guy, but he was put in power by the Romans and his his whole allegiance was to the Roman uh, empire. And as such, then this is a Roman authority that's being dealt with. And Jesus's response is quite interesting. He says, you tell that fox. Now, apparently he actually has some feeling or some understanding that these people are in direct connection with Herod, that maybe they're warning him of Herod's anger and so forth had, uh, had some, uh, implicit, uh, meaning that, that really isn't there on the surface. It looks like they're trying to warn him so that he can save his life, but they may have other purposes for what they're doing there. Anyway, Jesus says, you tell that fox 
that I've got work to do today, I've got work to do tomorrow, and I'm going to keep doing my work until I get to Jerusalem, because it would not be right for a prophet to die outside the city of Jerusalem. And so he's basically saying, Herod, if Herod wants to kill me, I'm not afraid of him. I uh, Here's where I am. Here's the road I'm taking to Jerusalem. And you just tell him he, if he wants to find me, he can. Here's where I am. But what's interesting is he says to Herod, you tell that fox. Now, there's a lot of a lot of discussion among some kinds of Bible scholars as to what why Jesus called him a a fox, and, and I know in the Passion of the Christ, if you'll remember, uh, he is dressed up and made to appear as a very decadent person, uh, far more interested in sex than anything else, and and uh, and so it may be that there's some implication there because the word fox has a feminine ending on it, and uh, so maybe there's that. But whatever, whatever it was, uh, whether he was smart as a fox or something, you know, I don't know. But all scholars tend to be in agreement that it was an insult, that it was a calculated insult when Jesus called him a fox. And, and I find that very interesting that Jesus would speak of an authority of that sort uh, with, with something less than complete respect. So that's fascinating. But then he gets to Jerusalem. And among many other things, we find the 23rd chapter of Matthew. Now, sometimes this is referred to as the chapter of woes, because over and over again, Jesus begins a declaration with, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. And it's basically a kind of curse that he puts on him, on them over and over again. And he, he, he curses them for being hypocrites. He curses them for being slave drivers. He curses them for being schemers fakes, murderers. He calls them snakes. That is to say, the, the language is brood of vipers, but basically snakes. Mm -hmm. And he declares at the end of this chapter, you are under the wrath of God. Now, again, that was calculated on Jesus's part to drive them to such distraction that they could think of nothing but killing him because he understood it was his time to die on the cross for the sins of mankind. And so fascinatingly enough, then he was not afraid to look these people right in the eye and uh, and 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 call them the worst sorts of names that could be imagined in his day, and and uh, and and that's the example. If Jesus is our example, that's part of the overall example that he sets for us, especially when we are faced with governmental powers, as the Pharisees and and the scribes and the Pharisees were, uh, when we're faced with governmental powers that do not have our best interests in heart probably the most quoted and misquoted uh, passage in scripture is Romans 13. Why has it been so frequently misinterpreted and misused by Christian leaders? Well, it's an interesting question that you just asked. And I, I came across an article by a, a scholar named Sarah Morgan Smith, and she works for some kind of a Christian think tank. And believe it or not, there are such things down in the United States. And, and, and so she writes from a, uh, a kind of an American point of view. And yet, as I said earlier, if it's a truly Christian point of view, then for Christians, it, it's a universal point of view. But one of the things that she um, that she says in, in this article is that um, uh, that she, first of all, she writes against the idea that Christians, apart from some explicitly religious point, a uh, religious issue, that Christians do not have any rights to civil disobedience, because here's what she says. What we forget is that in the first century, people were not, I mean, apart from a few privileged characters, like including even the Apostle Paul, people were generally not citizens. They were subjects. They were slaves of a tyrannical government. Uh, and, and they had no rights as such. They were subjects, not citizens. But that does not apply to anyone living in Canada or the United States or basically any Western nation. Uh, and maybe other places too, but I, I, you know, whether we're talking about Great Britain or even most of the European nations uh, today, uh, you are a citizen, you are not a subject. And as such, you have the right to participate in the decisions that the government makes and how the government manages itself, itself and, be, and, uh, and, and behaves itself. And so I think this is a really, really important uh, point. Uh, she says at one point, reformed Christians have long held that to neglect to defend one's civil liberties is the equivalent of political suicide and just as forbidden to unbelievers. In other words, just as suicide is forbidden to unbelievers, uh, I'm sorry, just as forbidden to believers, just as suicide is forbidden to believers. In other words, 
we're to, we're to always have hope as long as as long as there is God in heaven. There's never a time when we're entirely without hope when our life is hopeless. There's never an excuse for uh, suicide in terms of taking our own physical lives. And what and what uh, she's saying here is that in the same way, there's no excuse for committing political suicide by allowing. Uh, in the name of peace, allowing our civil liberties to be taken away from us. She actually has a, um, uh, again, she, she quotes from, and she's looking now at the American, at the, at the roots of the American Revolution against Great Britain. And, uh, and she, she talks about a pamphlet. Actually, I looked it up, and it's at, you can easily find it on the Internet. It's, it's available to read for yourself if you'd like. And the title of the pamphlet was Loyalty Vindicated. It was published in 1698. And it condemns, and this is a quote, the damned doctrines of passive obedience and non-resistance. And, um, and she points out that the author argues, and this I'll just give you this one sentence, but I would encourage people to read this. I just, it's simply called Loyalty Vindicated, published in 1698. The author argues that the colonial government's failure to protect its citizens' liberties was tantamount to a failure to protect their lives. In other words, in those days, Liberty and the rights of a citizen were more important than their human, uh, than maintaining the life of their, of their physical, you know, the existence of their physical uh, life. And, and uh, then, of course, you think of Patrick Henry in the Virginia uh, Commons there where he, you know, shouts, give me liberty or give me death, because there are things that can make life not even worth living. And we need, in my view, and of course, Patrick Henry was a man of deep faith as well, Christian faith very much informed. All these are, um, are people who quote scripture repeatedly in their doctrines and in their speeches, in their pamphlets and speeches. And, um, and, and they recognize that without liberty, there is no real humanity, uh, that, 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 that we're not, that we're to be individually responsible before God, that the, the, the life of the hive is appropriate to ants and bees, perhaps, but not to human beings. You mentioned like the first century Christians. Um, it's so interesting the parallels we can draw between Grace Life and Pastor James Coates with his congregation now worshiping in secret and hiding and how much right. that echoes the experience of the, those first century Christians. But yes, <laughs> yes. And it is interesting that they too have been, you know, worshiping in secret, like you say, uh, just like Christians had to do for the first 300 years of their history in the Roman Empire uh, until basically the time of Constantine. And uh, and then there have been times since then. I mean, actually, there have been many times even in English history where uh, if you weren't part of the, shall we say, the, uh, the the Catholic wing of the Anglican Church, if you were part of the evangelical wing, even of the Anglican Church, let alone some kind of, of non-Anglican, you had to meet in secret for a long period of time in, in, in that period. So then specifically getting back to Romans 13, to bring it back to the very real political situation. Uh, what, sorry, what, sorry, sir. No, I love it. It's great. But what is what is the threshold um, that obedience is due? And what is the threshold that our, our civic responsibility to freedom and justice and truth are due in light of that specific passage? Because that's really the crux of the conversation. It is. It is. Okay, so I'll say a couple things really quickly. On the surface, even, we ought to understand that scriptures have to be balanced, that sometimes there are scriptures that appear to be almost contradictory, but that, in fact, we're just looking for a way to balance them. And generally speaking, in the moment, you know which is the right way to go. For example, we have Romans 13 that says we're to obey the authorities because they are uh, instituted by God. In fact, I'll just read the sentence. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So there is that in Romans 13. But then in Acts chapter 5, the apostles looking the Pharisees in the face and the Sanhedrin court in the face, they say to them, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now, what's interesting is that when you start looking at these two things, they do appear to be contradictory until you come to the period of the Reformation. And there you find a, a almost universal agreement among the primary reformers, Luther and Calvin and and some of the others, uh, William Farrell and some of the others. You find a, a strong agreement, John Knox in Scotland, you find a strong agreement that what we're, what we're called upon to do is always be looking for our obedience to God, and then as long as we can coordinate our obedience to God with obedience to man, then all is well, the authorities that be. But that we all always need to be aware that sinful authorities can, in fact, 
because the, the authorities are not, generally speaking, not believers. It, it's certainly in the Roman period, they weren't believers at all. And so they could, in fact, uh, disqualify themselves as authorities before God when they begin to order things that are not of God. And, and one of the things that uh, Morgan Smith points out in the article that I've been referring to here, uh, she points out that in uh, right across the West, Europe and North America, right across the West, authorities have attempted to tell people how to worship. Um, I actually preached, I won't say where now, but I preached at a church uh, just in the last several weeks where I was informed beforehand that, uh, you know, first of all, we had to wear masks in the service, and we did. Uh, and I, would, I was told I could take the mask off when I stood behind a, a large plastic shield and probably 20 feet from the nearest person as I stood behind the pulpit to preach, then I could take my mask off for the preaching. Otherwise, I had to wear it. And then I was told, we are supposed to, we're asked only to hum the hymns. We're not supposed to sing them. But he said, with a twinkle in his eye, the, the song, the worship leader said to me, if you've got a mask on, I can't tell what's happening behind that mask. And so if you choose to sing the words, I won't, I won't try to stop you. But you'll notice what, what's going on here. They've asked us to hum, not to sing. They've, they've said to, to us, we know how you can worship acceptably before God in this setting. And, uh, and so there have been some places uh, right across the world where, the Western world in particular, where um, singing has been completely forbidden. And of course, they limit how many people can come to the work place of worship and how far apart they have to sit. And, and they're, what they're doing in many cases is, and in, in, in my view, explicitly doing, is taking away our human rights before God to worship according to our conscience. So final word to you then, um, resistance and opposition to the current restrictions, lockdown measures varying as they are across Canada. Um, is it contrary to Christ's teaching, contrary to Christ's life, contrary to the example of St. Paul to the Gentiles to oppose these restrictions? And how can one ethically oppose? So if you're saying, is it, uh, is it contrary to Jesus and Paul to oppose these restrictions? My short answer is no. It is not contrary to their example or their teaching, uh, because what they've done is given us a responsibility to know what is right in every circumstance. And, uh, and, and, and it is, you know, we can talk about the hypocrisy, if we want, of a government that will allow hundreds of people to congregate in a Walmart or a superstore, uh, you know, a Costco. Hundreds of people can congregate in there. And I assure you that every time I go into one of those places, I see people walk, you know, they're, they're, they're shopping for the same item on the shelf. They're standing side by side, reaching, you know, for whatever. There's no social distancing in those places, but nobody complains about that. On the other hand, if they find out that, you know, 16% of the congregation is worshiping uh, together, all of a sudden it becomes a, a, a major, a major case. And, and, uh, and that is, that is hypocrisy of the first order, but it also demonstrates something I think of the real spirit behind these laws. Uh, Erwin Lutzer, I don't know if people know that name. Erwin Lutzer was the pastor at Moody Memorial Church in Chicago for many years, a, a Saskatchewan, a real scholar, a writer of many books and so forth, and a, a Saskatchewan boy by birth, raised in Saskatchewan, so a Canadian. Erwin Lutzer has said, that which is canceled today will be criminalized tomorrow. And it does seem to me that if we allow people to cancel things for us, and tell churches how they're to worship, well, then we've got a problem because what they're doing is preparing the groundwork for, gen, for real criminalization. The charter very plainly says that there is to be the due process of law to declare that for a particular emergency, it is, it is necessary for our charter rights to be removed. But the, the law, in my as I read it, and I've read that charter statement more than, uh, well, quite a few times in the last few months, the, the law, as I read it, does not, um, does not allow a, 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 an appointed government official, like a health officer, to simply declare that charter rights are, you know, they don't have that right. That's for the legislatures and for the uh, parliament to decide, not for appointed bureaucrats. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm very concerned that Christians have not stood for their rights more. And I completely, I mean, I applaud J, uh, James Coates and Grace Life Church and, and uh, the other churches that uh, are standing. I know there are seven churches in Manitoba that are standing up for their, 
their rights on based on the charter. I applaud them with all my being because they're fighting for the rights and liberties of all Canadians. If they can take away Christians' rights, churches, they can take away the rights of anybody at any moment at a whim and we'll have no voice left. Certainly, uh, the authorities have been trying to cancel Christianity for 2,000 years, and uh, it seems that that is not coming to an end anytime soon. I want to thank you so much for sharing your insight today and joining me. Um, where can people find you if they want to maybe follow up the conversation or learn a little bit more about your work? Thank you, Adam, for, for that opportunity. Sure. Uh, you could email me, uh, Schaefer Parker, S-H-A-F-E-R, Schaefer Parker, one word, uh, again, let me spell that first one because it's a little different. S-H-A-F-E-R, Parker, all one word, at hotmail.com. So just uh, send me an email and I'll do my best to respond. Well, we hope you enjoyed that conversation. If you want to continue enjoying conversations like that, it's important for you to go to rebelnews.com and sign up. If you're watching this on YouTube right now, it's only a matter of time, we think, before we're kicked off the platform entirely, and we don't want to lose touch. So again, go to rebelnews.com and sign up, and you won't miss a thing. Thanks.